You're listening to the Zenob Podcast's Mad Valuation Series, where we bring to you the latest in mergers, acquisitions, divestitures, specifically in the technology space. Hear from the industry's best as they deconstruct the ins and outs of all things mergers and acquisitions. Hello, everyone, and welcome to an all-new episode of the Zenob Podcast M&A Series the one-stop shop where you learn about all things mergers and acquisitions in the global technology ecosystem. I am Praveen Badada, Managing Partner at Zinov, and I'll be your host for today. Mergers and acquisitions have become a staple for technology companies, with announcements of new deals flying in from all corners of the ecosystem. This has only heated up since early part of this year, specifically in the hyper-intelligent automation space, where companies have leveraged M&A to not only strengthen their capabilities, but also future-proof their businesses against disruptions like the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Fresh off an acquisition by a major PE player, TPG Capital, for a staggering $2 billion plus, I have with me today Nintex's CEO, Eric Johnson, who has helmed the company over the last seven plus years from strength to strength. From growing Nintex's sales by six times in a period of seven years, to maintaining a customer retention rate of an impressive 93 plus percent, Eric has taken Nintex to greater and greater heights. But what are the best practices that help PE-owned companies to reach higher valuations? What are the different aspects that a CXO of a PE-owned company needs to be cognizant of? Eric will help us answer some of these burning questions on this podcast today. With that, welcome Eric, and it's great to have you one more time on this podcast series today with us. Thank you, Praveen. Great, great to be here and, and looking forward to this discussion. Hope we can help a few people out. Perfect. Sounds good. So uh, let's just dive right in. First of all, many congratulations on the investment round from TPG and such a great testimony of the strong foundation uh, on which you have really built Nintex over these years. Uh, and you've truly become a dominant player in the hyper-intelligent automation world. If you just look at the journey, the last seven, eight years that you've been with Nintex, you've literally engaged with three very large private equity firms like TA Associates, Toma Bravo, TPG, and all of that. It'll be really good if you can decouple the PE world a little bit for our audience, who these firms really are, how do they get the money they invest in companies like you, and more importantly, how do they really generate returns for their investors? If you can give a little bit of perspective on that, Eric, to get started, that'll be awesome. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be happy to give you my perspective on, you know, kind of the private equity universe, especially as it relates to technology and software investing. I would say that the universe is large these days and, and really what um, fuels the opportunity for these private equity funds to be so big is you've got large pools of institutional capital, particularly if you think of pension funds, um, you think of college endowments, these pools of capital are extremely large and they're very global and they need to have homes. And some of what they want to invest in, they're they're going for higher returns. And so when you look at the opportunity to invest in privately held software companies, you know, that's an opportunity to have high growth. And so these private equity investors, first and foremost, the investors that they have providing them the capital are fairly large scale, sophisticated investors. The investment sizes they're making are typically in the minimums of tens of millions. In fact, some of the funds will literally have maybe five to 10, what they call limited partners. And those could each be investing hundreds of millions. And so large, sophisticated pools of money coming in. And then these private equity funds themselves tend to be, and there's a little bit of variety of who they are, but they're generally looking for companies that have a little bit of maturity. So you're not typically in a private equity fund going to be investing in a cash burning early stage startup. You're typically investing in an organization that has been around for at least you know, probably several years um, on on north to 10, 15, 20 years, but organizations that have been around, they've proven market fit, they've generally created a business model that can at least be moderately profitable and could be very profitable. In the private equity universe, oftentimes the, they're financing these purchases partly with equity, right? The, the dollars they bring in from their limited partners, but they're also able to put some leverage, some debt on these businesses because they do have the ability to to be profitable. Kind of given the factors of what they're trying to do, it sort of goes after a certain type of company. I would say that in large part, the private equity funds are looking to, you know, have these businesses grow, you know, so some organic growth combined with typically some inorganic or or acquisitions that the the business um, will then go deal. And they're trying to generally help them be a little bit more efficient. Now that's not 
always true. Sometimes they're investing in a business that already has a very high level of efficiency. So it's more of a growth oriented thesis. And that's one of the things I would say is that, um, and I got this when I, you know, first worked with a PE sponsor back a couple of companies ago, a lot of the team members in the, in the company, right? They think all the PEs are the same and that's actually not true. Different EE funds have actually a little bit different strategies. They have different ways that they work with management teams. As an operator, you're really trying to do is, is find the right private equity sponsor to match what you're trying to do with the business in that season. And that can vary in the life cycle of a company. Awesome. Lo lots of follow on questions. I think at the last count, uh, we learned that about $2 trillion worth of capital is waiting to be deployed from the private equity channel, right? So the dry powder is huge in the market today. And we are realizing, Eric, that a lot of PE firms, and you touched upon that as well, are getting really interested in technology and the software businesses. Right? Historically, they've invested in real estate, on all industrial businesses, really legacy businesses. But suddenly there's this rush around technology and software. So what's really happening in that part of the world? Why are PE firms excited about technology in general? Yeah, I mean, I think it just comes down to growth opportunity, right? And if you look at the growth rates in our industry, and you know, we have lots of different sub segments and all that, but if you just looked at enterprise software as a whole, our industry grows much faster than the general economy. And so if you look at the ability to create outsized returns or you know, alpha for their investors, it, you gotta be where things are growing. And so in a world where you know real estate valuations are at record highs, you know, most asset classes are very high, but most asset classes don't actually grow very much. If you think of something like an industrial segment or retail businesses, in a lot of those industries, growth rates are low single digits. In the technology industry, in many of our categories, growth rates are 10%, 15, maybe even 20 in certain categories. So investment dollars want to follow where growth opportunity is. And there's very few, and maybe, you know, it's arguable that we're probably the best growth opportunity of all industrial segments, industry segments in the world is, is software. Interesting. That's very interesting point of view, because if we generally look at the private equity world, right? Most of the PE firms would turn over their companies in a period of three to four years, right? Sometimes some funds are perpetual yep. kind of roadmap, but most of the funds will turn over companies in three to five year kind of a period, right? So when you talk about growth and when you look at this time frame, are PEs able to generate that growth momentum in such a short period of time? How do they look at growth and this timeline, time horizon together? What comes at play? when they mix and match these two uh, kind of distinct scenarios? Well, first off, I'd say in our industry, three to four years is actually a really long time. <laughs> in a lot of industries, you'd say three or four years sounds like short, and boy, that's a short investment horizon, you know, especially in some other segments, the PE funds may own companies for seven to 10 years. I think in our industry, change is so rapid and growth rates, back to the growth comment, are so high that in three to four, five years, you can make a lot of difference in a business. and. You know, if you think about what's generally happening, there's, you know, a couple of different flavors. Sometimes a PE is investing in a business that already has really good momentum. And then they're basically trying to capitalize on that and help management, maybe even accelerate it, maybe add some incremental things to the strategy. In other cases, sometimes PE is investing in a business that's maybe having some challenges and they see opportunity to help the business execute better, maybe modify the strategy, maybe do some different acquisitions. And so there's, there's really a, a range of what's possible. But I would say, given the pace of change in our industry, three to four years with good, aggressive activity, you can make a ton of difference in what a business looks like. On that note, let's just talk about Nintex a little bit. And you, of course, got a new PE owner last week. You, of course, had many other options, right? Like taking the company IPO or selling it to one of the insurer sponsors, selling it to a strategic buyer like a tech giant. You could mm -hmm. have gone to a VC fund. Why did you make this particular choice versus all the other choices that were available for you, uh, Eric? Yeah, well, I'd say, first of all, these decisions are always a combination between the management team and the investors, right? And in our case, we had one investor who was a clear majority in Tomo Bravo. Um, we had another investor that was a clear minority, but, but pretty substantial in TA Associates. And then we had uh, some smaller investors in management on the, on the rest. And so. Partly what you're trying to do is align everyone's interest and ultimately, right, the private equity funds have their limited partners. And so they've got to make sure that they're doing the right thing for their investors 
obviously management cares a lot about the company and the team and the customers and the partners. And so you're trying to find what that happy situation is. In the case of Nintex, we have been making really good progress. And if I look at the last, you know, three and a half years or so since Tomo Bravo has been our majority sponsor, we've more than doubled the size of the company. We've doubled the number of capabilities that we can offer customers. So massive increase in use case coverage of what we can do. Part of that was organic innovation. Part of that was really good acquisitions. And we've made the company on a dollar basis about four times as profitable. So you know, we've made a ton of progress. We have really good momentum. Our customers are super happy with us. And then we were looking at our strategy of what we wanted to do for the next few years and, and how could we solve even more problems for the customers? How could we show up even more often? And that comes down to, we want to invest more in product innovation, go to market, and we want to continue to do more acquisitions and probably bigger acquisitions. And with that in mind, when you look at being a public company, reality of being a public company is it's, it's I've been in public companies as an executive in my past. It can be great, but you want to make sure you have a, a story that at that point is really clean, super understandable, and that you're not going to have to do hard things that investors might struggle with. Public company investors, many of them are very short-term focused. And so if we were to go out and try to do an acquisition that maybe long-term we thought was right, but short term might be a little hard on profitability or may hurt our growth rate. Public company investors don't love those. Private company, private equity company investors have a little longer time horizon they're thinking through. And so if management and the PE fund are aligned, we can be more aggressive on M&A. And we have a few ideas that fall into that category. So I think from our strategy perspective, we felt like for the next probably two or three years, we would be better to be private. We could make more progress faster and it would be better for our customers. And ultimately the company would be bigger, even stronger, more strategic and more valuable. So not only would it be good for um, current investors, it'd be good for what our investors would be making in the future. And it also just so happened to be that the private equity valuation environment is really strong. So, you know, I think that current investors with this current deal with TPG, TA is going to be moving on out, but they've sustained a tremendous return. And so, you know, far in excess of anything they could have originally hoped for. So they are super happy about that. Their limited partners will be very, very happy and feel really good about what we've done. Now, the other option was to sell to a strategic. We just felt like with what we're doing and where we are and, and the things we'll do over the next few years, we would just be leaving a ton of value on the table. I also think as we get a little further in our strategy, we're just more appealing. We are about two thirds subscription revenue, about 90% recurring in total today. Give us another two or three years. We'll be even a higher percent subscription. We'll have a few more product capabilities. We'll have consolidated some of the market. That type of company will be very, very appealing to all types of investors. And so at the end of the day, Praveen, it's partly about matching up strategy. And then also at the end of the day, right, it's value creation. And we just felt like the right thing to do to make more progress on strategy, more value creation was to partner up with TPG and, and continue on as a private company. Company. Excellent. No, amazing. I think Nintex's uh, growth over the last couple of years has been phenomenal. And I think uh, you've been the poster boys, if, if you will, in the automation space, right? So absolutely amazing story. If you look at the PE funds, right, there are about 100 large PE funds who are looking at technology and software investments. So when you were thinking of raising money, did a lot of these PEs approach to you or you were very selective in reaching out a couple of them where you felt the fitment was right? How does this really work out for companies who are looking to raise money through this channel? Who finds who or yeah. kind of how does the mechanics really work, uh, Eric? Yeah, so I think there's different ways it can work. What I'll, I'll explain is how we've worked it and kind of my personal bias. That doesn't mean it's the only way. Certainly other people have probably had successful with uh, different routes. I'd say as we got more notoriety over the last few years, and particularly when Tomo Bravo came in as our lead investor, that and our scale and achieving like the, the rankings we have with, with your firm and others, we got more interest. And so we certainly would have month on month, nearly every month, at least a handful of, of firms reach out. I would say that because of our scale and the level of value we felt we were achieving, we had a pretty good idea of the smaller set of firms that would likely be potentially good partners for us in the future. One of the things I did over, over time specifically is put some effort into making some of those relationships and sustaining them. And I would say like, I'll give a lot of credit to TPG. I mean, Nahal was awesome at initial outreach more than a couple of years ago. And then he and I just kept the dialogue going and he would share some perspectives on what he was seeing in the market. I would share some perspectives on what I was seeing and the progress we were making. And we really built a great relationship in a two plus year period. And the more we talked, it's just the more we could see the possible, right? There was just a very small number of firms that 
primates tends to us. Obviously, we also have some really good investment bank relationships. We noted in our press release one lead bank and another bank that helped us, Lead Bank Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and then Macquarie, who's also a, a small investor in ours. On the TPG side, you know, Morgan Stanley was constructive and very helpful and does a lot for them. And so that banking universe also does help. But I, what I would encourage all the the CEOs and CFOs to really think about is if they are thinking private equity is a good option for their business, I would encourage making those relationships over time. And some of that could be with the, the lead bank or two that you work with. Some of it could be on your own, but that investment and relationship building then creates understanding and confidence. So then when you are ready to potentially do something, there's a lot more ability for that private equity sponsor to really lean in and be aggressive. And you want to be in a position where you're picking versus not picking. And I felt like we were in a good position to where we had some really awesome choices. And I can't tell you just how enthused our whole team is to be partnering up with TPG. I mean, the resources, the strategic nature, the integrity of the team, these are just really, really, really good people. And I'm also really happy that Tomo Bravo has decided to keep some money in plus make a material new investment. And so we'll be a very significant minority investor. So I really feel like my team, and I we're like, wow, I mean, how blessed are we? We got the best of both worlds. We have TPG, we have Tomo Bravo. We've got an awesome management team and team throughout every level of this company. So very, very thankful. Perfect. That's awesome. So now the new PE firm is there, they're on board. What happens next, right? How do the first hundred days really look like uh, as the CEO of this company now, how do you get involved with TPG on a day-to-day -day basis? Give us a little bit of a sense in terms of how the first few days with the new partner really look like. Yeah. So one of the first things I would say, and just for advice for everybody, especially anybody in the CEO seat, we have three core tenants here. And, and one of them is, is a real personal passion. Well, all three very personal passion for me, but but one is something I've said for years. Our first one is deliver on our commitments, right? Follow, following through. The second one is don't wait. Third one is operate with respect and consideration. That don't wait philosophy really applies when you get a new private equity sponsor. So you're going to be working together. Let's say you've negotiated an agreement. You've got a kind of general construct. And then you're going to sign a share purchase agreement. And there's typically a little gap in our world between signing the share purchase agreement, which is effectively when you're really you're, you're going together and close because you got typically at scale, there's some regulatory reviews and there's just some mechanics to get all the way to close. So that period might be 30 to 60 days. Well, one attitude would be, hey, we're not closed yet. And so I'm gonna kind of keep doing what I was doing. I'm gonna wait, ooh, waiting, really bad idea. So the approach we've taken, um, we did, and I was here at the front with Tomo Bravo, obviously here now as we're getting engaged with TPG, our attitude is you don't wait. And you really try to get deep with the investor right away get aligned on any sort of strategy enhancements or refinements you're going to make for the next season of life and start getting after it. So I would say in our specific case, we have a standing weekly meeting every Friday with a few of the TPG key leaders that we're working with, a few of my key leaders. And then throughout the week, we're engaging on different things. And so we're already in motion on, um, you know, they have done a bunch of research in the process. And so we have a, like a strategy day next week. And so even prior to official close, you're already starting to do some planning and you're already starting to think through what's possible in the future. The reason that's so important is then when you close, you can hit the ground running, right? And you can start to actually enact some of your strategy really, really early in the horizon. I mean, it, the thing about our industry is it moves so fast. Every day that you're not making progress, somebody else is getting ahead of you, right? And so every day you can make progress, but you're getting ahead of somebody else. And so that's the thing here. We just try to go super fast and, and it's exhausting. I mean, I'm not going to lie. There are times when I think myself or the team maybe feels like we need a little oxygen. And I, I suppose that's what a little vacation here or there is for, but go fast, get right in there right after close. You just get off to a sprint. It's like a sprint marathon is the way I like to describe it. I love the don't wait kind of philosophy, right? And the fact that you've already started deeply discussing the strategy for the next season, even before the deal is formally closed, right? So I think just getting the head start probably is very important there. Uh, tell us a little bit, you have done this many times in, in your career at Nintex, right? Where do PE firms really come in very handy, right? Do they actually help you make deals? Do they help you find the right talent or they just give you the money and watch the show? Like what's the level of involvement? What specific areas do PE really uh, unlock value for their portcos? Well, so I, I would say, um, Praveen, it really depends. There's a wide spectrum of what PE funds provide. There are some PE 
PE funds today that are still kind of what they were like 30 years ago, which is really just pure investors where mm -hmm. they're just investing behind whatever management thinks is best. And they're operating more as almost like external investors and as provided things work, they kind of leave people alone. I, I would say the world has shifted a little bit to private equity funds having more resources and having more value to add. If I look at the last few experiences I've had with PE, each of the PE funds had some value to directly add. If I think about partnering up with Tomo Bravo, I would say there's really two things that Tomo Bravo has been really helpful with us over the last few years. One is they have a, a really good engine around acquisitions, and that includes everything from sourcing to financing to diligence resources and modeling. And so the, the ability to see deal flow and help us find things, that was very, very constructive, right? And so really good partnership on the whole acquisition side of the house, I'd say is one thing that a lot of these funds can do. And Tomo Bravo certainly has a really good capabilities there. I'd say the other thing that Tomo Bravo brought to the table is they have this operating partner model where they have basically generally ex-CEOs and CFOs, and they join the board on um, the join as operating partners and i'd say that they're probably the way i describe them as a more active board member than you would typically see and in my specific case i kind of looked at the talents and experiences of each one and then i would align them to areas where i thought we had some opportunity or something that you know one of my senior executives or some team members were challenged with and that person could bring some of their experiences and perspectives and relationships to bear and help us out and so whether it was some aspects of our go-to-market strategy things we were trying to accelerate in our product Product organization, how did we going to do customer success or some of the, the kind of narrow but very strategic professional services capabilities we had? You know, in all those areas, those operating partners were able to add some of their expertise and relationships and definitely helped us. Generally, we come up with a lot of the ideas and, and own the outcome, but it's great to have someone else you can bounce things off of who's got an awesome experience, can add some ideas, can validate, can challenge. And so I'd say with Tomo Bravo is that. Now, I, I, in a couple other situations I've been in, including the one we're just starting, TPG is a really large firm and so already i've had some exposure there's a human capital group you know they have a leader of that group who's a world-class person used to be one of the co-heads of spencer stewart in the u.s and so there's resources in that group around talent acquisition you know how do you go recruit the right executives how do you build the right team there's a comp expert world-class comp expert to work with they've got pricing experts on staff and so the way to think about it is in a lot of these firms they almost have like many in-house consulting firms and so you're, you're getting like a bunch of people who are really top tier experts in their domain who you can leverage for one or more areas. And sometimes it might be getting a little help from them and then also still having a third party, but they refer you to one that they've used a lot. And so my encouragement to any of the CXOs that you guys are spending time with or might be listening to this podcast today is take advantage of the resources. You, you need to make the decision on what's right for your company. It's probably not all of them, but where you have those things, it goes right back to that don't wait philosophy. You got to move fast. I mean, the faster you move, you want to stay ahead of your investors. You want to stay ahead of commitments you've made and objectives. The more you're ahead, the more momentum you have, the bigger the outcome is going to be, the happier the investors are, the more enjoyment you're going to have coming to the office every day. The more you fight these things, you start getting behind your objectives, then this is where private equity universities can go really bad really fast. And so I would just say stay ahead. Perfect. And what would you say is your biggest learning in terms of what are the easiest parts to work on with the PE? What are very tough? You need a lot more collaboration, a lot more involvement from both sides. Can you just generalize the easy parts and the tough parts of working with a private equity firm? Well, I'd say probably every situation could be a little bit different. I would say one part that's like center of the fairway, I think, at least in my experience, has been really productive, whether it was TA Associates initially when I came here, Tom Rabo, and, and now just starting up TPG. I think the whole zone of acquisitions, I think that's really a thing that most of these private equity funds today, they want to buy a great company or a good company or a high potential company, and then they want to build around it. And part of the build is to, to go out and buy some other companies. And so I would say most of them have a really good, you know, they have some strong capabilities and experience in acquiring companies. And so that's an area that I think works. You can align with really easily. You get into other areas, like for example, go to market, right? Everybody always wants to sell more. Everybody always wants more ARR, more new bookings, right? That's a universal desire. Um, now exactly how to do that and what opportunities exist and how to do that most efficiently, well, that that is a different thing. And in some cases, right, it might be really clear and easy, but in a lot of cases, it's not. 
you know, you may have a situation where a business has a lot of opportunities. In our specific case, our market is really big. We have multiple components of our platform. You're always making these decisions like, well, what's the best one, two, or three to go focus on? Can't do everything, but we have a lot of choices, right? So we have a kind of a problem, a lot of choice. In other scenarios, you may have a business that's maybe in a smaller vertical market. Maybe there aren't as many choices. And so it's more about how do you refine it? How do you get execution even better? So I would say that whole figuring out how to accelerate go to market and drive more new bookings and ARR growth, that in my experience is probably one of the more complicated points of aligning with private equity fund. Everybody wants it, but the way to get there is, is not as always quite as clear when you think of a, a ceo of a company like in this case you are the ceo of index and you, you've built obviously excellent relationships with the private equity firms and the individuals from those firms how would you abstract the traits that a ceo the qualities that a ceo should really have to be able to build very strong relationship with the pe firms and the operating partners and the investment partners in those firms what should the yeah. ceo really have Here's what I would say, and I thought about this a lot now as I've, I've done it longer, and I was at a company two companies ago where we were private equity owned by a massive private equity fund. So I've spent probably close to 15 of my years have had some sort of private equity ownership of, of my career, so roughly two thirds of it. I would say from a CEO perspective, if you're going to be successful with private equity and choose to partner up with one, I, I would say a CEO who's open, who's really open to feedback and always desiring to get better is probably a CEO who's going to have more success, a CEO who's more direct and confident enough that when it's not working or something's off, that they can be really clear with their private equity team members and partners that they're working with, right? I think those two, and then have a high pace of urgency, right? I mean, at the end of the day, the private equity funds, and they're all a little different, but they, they've got a time horizon, right? They've got investors that they're making commitments to, right? And the way they're going to get and continue to get more capital coming in from those limited partners is, is that they're going to deliver great returns. They're going to deliver distributions over time on a schedule that's somewhat predictable. And so that urgency from the, the CEO side is really clear. And so I would say if I had to boil it down to three things, it would be urgency, it'd be openness, and it'd be directness. I would say in my experience, we're seeing some CEOs that went not so great with private equity and ended up typically being either really unhappy or getting exited from the business. It's typically situations where maybe they weren't as open to the feedback or making change. They weren't as open to using the resources. They weren't clear when it wasn't good. When here's hey, this is not good. This is a place we're having a problem. Here's what we're going to do about it. And then being open to some input. And then third, maybe not having that urgency. I think if you're a person who just kind of wants to work in your own universe and just like kind of have the money, but no collaboration, you better hope you're crushing those numbers. And I, I'd say the only way that that ends up working out okay is if you're just so far ahead of your numbers that people love good numbers, right? But in order to get to good numbers, I would generally say the three things I mentioned are going to increase your odds of getting to better numbers because you're going to be optimizing your business and making good changes. You're going to be directly hitting on challenges head on and, and be open to solutions and you're going to be moving fast. So if you're not the person who wants to do those things, then I would suggest don't partner up with private equity. Makes sense. Makes sense. I think that's a very interesting point. Uh, talk to us a little bit about also CEOs who are looking at the private equity investors for the first time, right? I mean, you had this advantage that you've done this for 15 years. So probably you were in a little bit of a comfort zone in terms of knowing how the entire scenario would, would unfold, right? But people who are maybe trying to partner with PE firms for the first time, what would be your advice to those kind of companies and the CEOs of those companies? Yeah, well, I mean, I think first I'd bring it back one step even higher, which is what are you trying to do with the business and really what is the right type of investor structure? So think through the strategy of, of where you're trying to take the business and also the agenda of whatever your current investors want to do, wh whoever those may be. Sometimes you may have a business that's more privately held or maybe it's had venture investors and now it's gotten to a little different scale. It's thinking about that next event, or maybe it needs a liquidity event. So let's say you you decided that private equity is the, the right zone, you and whatever current investors you have, then I would say it's really think through given what the strategy is for the business going forward or what you think this optimal strategy is, which private equity firms match that. Partly it's that bent between growth and profit. And even within growth, how much of the growth you're going to go achieve is, is organic growth versus acquisition and inorganic oriented growth. Different firms have sort of different things they're really good at and that 
are there sweet spots versus how much of your play might be more of a profit expansion, you know, maybe some M&A, but it's more of a let's grow profit play. There's a whole range in there and there's different seasons of a business. If I look at the last few years in our business, we had a real balance between growth and profit, right? We grew the top line a lot, but we also grew our efficiency massively. Now in this next season, we've, we've gotten the business to a place where we're very efficient already. Now what we're looking to do is accelerate growth even faster, both organically and inorganically. So I'd say for this next season, for us, it was finding that investor who was liked our level of efficiency we're at, but really wanted to take advantage of the massive market opportunity. And so my big advice to be would be for those CEOs who are evaluating their first private equity experience, you know, it's really picking the investor who's probably got the right expertise and natural affinity for your strategy. And then also getting the one that's at the right scale. I mean, there's different scales of private equity investors. There's private equity investors who are looking for companies that have enterprise value of 200 million or less. And then there's some that are looking for a billion dollars or less. And then, then you get into the zone like we're in now where you're, you're in with people who are generally investing in companies that have enterprise value in the multiple billions, maybe even 10 plus. There's just different funds and firms that play in different areas. Perfect. Uh, Thank you so much, Eric. I think there's been a truly delightful conversation. Not only did we learn about the PE players and how do they really create value, but also about the perspectives and learnings that CEOs of PE-owned firms get access to, right? So I'm I'm really sure that our audience today would have a lot of takeaways and a lot of interesting thoughts and ideas in terms of how they can craft their own experiences in the private equity world. So I really appreciate you taking out time, Eric, and our best wishes for the next season. We are rooting for you to get to the $20 billion valuation as soon as possible. I'm pretty sure with the team that you have and the investors you have, you should be able to get to that point much sooner than uh, what anyone would expect. So so really appreciate your time on this one. And thank you so much for all the insights uh, that you've shared with us today. Hey, thank you, Praveen. You know, I'm really proud of the team here at Nintex. We have just an awesome team at every level and the people that we partner with, you know, the, the various advisors and third parties that we've been able to work with over time are been a big part of it and super excited for what we're going to do together with TPG and Tomo Bravo in this next season. And like you said, I mean, I think that the dreams are really big here. The market supports it. And I hope today that many of the CEOs and, and CXOs who were listening to the call, hopefully got some value. You know, I know I've had a lot of people be really kind to me along the journey and help me out. And I love to give back to the universe and wish everybody continued success. And especially all of you at Zinob, you know, thanks for what you're doing for this market. You're really helping provide a lot of thought leadership. So thanks for your partnership for me. Thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Thank you everyone for tuning into this episode of the Zinov podcast M&A series, the most sought after destination for all things mergers and acquisitions in the technology ecosystem. Stay tuned for more such interesting episodes with pioneering leaders. We will be back soon. Till then, take care and stay safe. Thank you for listening to Zinov podcast Mad Valuation series. We hope you enjoyed and learned from the behind the scenes perspectives. You can listen to our other series filled with similar rich insights on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. Subscribe to our newsletter on our website, www.zinov.com, and follow us on LinkedIn to stay up to date on our latest content.